How many people are fans of Deadliest Catch? <laughs> okay. Okay, quite a bit of the room. Uh, I have become a huge fan in about two weeks since I met uh, Bob and Josh, who I'm about to introduce. Um, I love the show, and um, I love the culture of not only you know, what goes on out on the, uh, on the fishing vessels, but just the culture of creating the show. Bob Brownow is, um, is our, um, the um, mix re-recording engineer for the program, and um, Josh Earl is the, vi uh, the video editor. These guys are Emmy Award winning professionals. And, and they're the best at what they do. We're bringing in a resolution that's way lower than the average because it's about 16,000 hours of footage. Uh, that it, it goes from the uh, Z7s to 5D, 1D, 7D, GoPro. I mean, you name it, we got it out there at some point, and and we're messing with it, or or it's some of it's not in the system. So there could be a couple thousand hours sitting on a shelf of deck cams because basically you've got. This season we had, so we lost a boat this season with the Cornelia Murray, so I think we have six boats, six boats right now. So each one of those boats gets two camera producers, and one on the wheelhouse, one on the deck. And you're looking at each one of those guys is handed, I think, I feel like they get like three uh, Z7s to actually use on deck in the wheelhouse just because th those cameras don't make it back a lot of them they, they, we they they waterproof the crap out of them. i mean they're they're everything there's there's goop here and there so that no salt water can get into them but ultimately you got a stack of cameras about this high that'll never work again when we're done so if that's a couple however many millions of like you know ah, that's, that's your budget for cameras those aren't going to make it back so Everyone gets those, but then you also have deck cams. You have all the GoPros. Every now and again, they'll bust out the 7Ds, which we're shooting 60 frames, and that's just fun to play with. But, you know, they're, so they're getting all this stuff. Everything comes together, and, you know, they're taking care of all of it. Two camera guys on the boat. That's it. You know, it's just them with their deck, with their, with their cameras, with their notes all day long, every day, watching everything, taking notes, sending it back to us. Now, the, the way they get it back to us is in uh, giant uh, pelican cases. We, they basically, we have a chase boat that goes out and shoots the boats. While they're doing that, they'll pack everything they can into a pelican case, lock it up, throw it overboard, and then they kind of pray to God that that's not going to be destroyed somehow. So then the other boat will pick it up like a crab pot, pull it on board, and it gets back to Burbank. I, don't know, I think it's like a week or so later or something. It's, it takes a little while, but yeah. it gets back. Uh, you know, most of it. Uh, I don't think we've lost anything major no. uh, in, in years past, but, you know, there's a... So it gets back to us, and we have, like, a, an like artillery unit of just people ready to go, and they're constantly... There's digitizing going on 24 hours a day, getting ready for the editors who come out first. I, I usually end up cutting episode one and then kind of finishing the other episodes, and episode one is ready about a month and a half after when we get all the... Because all the digital media that comes in has to be laid off the tape, has to be, time code has to be slapped on it for up res, put in at a lower resolution. There's people looking through the deck cams as like watching all day long. It's, it's like an army that it takes to get it just ready to go to edit. And you know, once it's all in, all said and done, someone sits down and they take notes and it's like, okay, this is how, this is what happened out there. You know, someone has to look, there has to be a really good record of what happened because everyone's given a certain amount of dates, a certain amount of time that it's like, this is where your show takes place, this is where show two takes place, here's your dates, this is your dates. You know, like, here's, here's what you've got to work with. Ultimately, that adds, I mean, like, you're, it's roughly about 500 hours of stuff, but it's, I mean, people weed through it, you know, it's like, we don't have to look at all 500 hours, because that would suck, because story is huge in our, in our world, because, you know, a lot, like, what makes it more doc style is the fact that it's like, they have to have a conscious idea of what they're shooting, too because you need to know the right questions to ask. You need to know, I need to get this shot. I need to run back. I need to get that wide. I need to run up and, you know, because these guys, a lot of the good ones, you know, the, the, they won't put the camera down. They won't stop recording. You know, it's like that camera's rolling. Like that, they're getting everything. Whether it's good, bad, the ugly, they got, the, they got it right there and they've got it so you can use most of that footage. There's not a time where it's like the camera's like this and then they're like, okay, so what I need you to talk about now. It, no, it's like, it's this. It's like they're doing this and you've got to be able to be like, Okay, so explain to me a little bit about your son. You know, it's like any, I mean, if any of you worked on documentaries, it's kind of that way. You, you know what you want to, you know what you need them to talk about. So it's like, you just got to be like, hey, that person just got wiped across the deck. Is that a dangerous thing? You know, like you need to know that that's something you need to ask. So these guys are also, these camera guys aren't just 
They're not just shooting. They're, 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 they're conscious of the story, too. Of course, remember, they shoot 15, 16,000 hours of, of, uh, of footage. And of course, with sound people, we, we all know that's 32,000 hours of sound because we have stereo. Uh, <laughs> now, um, first things first, uh, there are no sound people on the boat. Uh, no sound mixers, no boom poles, no nothing. Uh, primarily, it's way too dangerous. If you could imagine being on a very small crab deck covered in six to 10 feet of ice, going over 40 foot waves and then trying to do this. <laughs> Not gonna happen. So it's a liability. The second thing is these boats are built and designed to do one thing, and that is to catch crab. They are not designed to house camera people or sound people. We've had camera people sleeping on the floors of the wheelhouse. We had uh, one guy who actually slept on a shelf in the pantry. <laughs> what I get is what comes off of a camera mic and what comes off of a lav, and that is if they choose to wear the lav. They've gotten a lot better about it, but remember, the thing about this show is these guys are fishing. They're fishermen. They are not actors. They are not paid a ton of money to be on the show. They're making their money by crab fishing. So it is not unusual to have them say, screw this. And it's within their rights. They're there. It's dangerous. They're there to fish, not to be on television. Basically what I get, and it wasn't until about the fourth season when I pleaded with them to actually get uh, some Sennheiser shotgun mics and stick those on the cameras because up until then we were just using whatever mics came with the camera. My mix process starts with once we get the OMF and we split out what we think is the best sounding audio, either it's a lav or it's a mic, uh, I spend, depending on the show, six to eight hours doing nothing but noise reduction. Uh, basically every single piece of audio gets through, put through some, point, some sort of noise reduction so we can eliminate as much background noise, as much hum as possible, because each of these boats, uh, you get to a point where you know the frequencies of the boats. My first job is removing all of that stuff and making sure that as best we can, we can hear what's being said. Uh, that is really, I see my primary goal. After that, it's making sure that we use sound to help tell the story and create tension and release and drama and basically focus the viewer's attention on what's important. There may be a situation where uh, one of the, the cameras that are mounted on deck, as they like to call them dumb cameras because they have no microphones on them, may catch an amazing wave going over the side of the boat and it may be the most dramatic moment of the, of the episode. Well, it recorded no sound. So in those situations, yeah, we need to build that so the experience that the viewer has is every bit as nerve-trembling and jarring as the experience that these guys are having. And to that end, I try as hard as I can to use uh, actual sounds recorded on the boats, uh, actual waves that were recorded on the boats, uh, as much as I possibly can, because to me, it's important to make it true. It's important to make it real. And uh, so over the years, I have pulled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different sound effects uh, from every clean stuff that I can find in an episode, because as I like to say, you know, you can't go to your sound ideas library and type in uh, 800 pound crab pot falling to steel deck. It just doesn't exist. So uh, I've created a pretty big library of, of natural sounds from the boats, and I will use that for backgrounds and for sound design use so that we can help the audio tell those stories when we're not actually given any audio. I always listen to what they've got on there, and that's the blueprint, because they may be trying to tell a story in one way, and I need to understand that that's the story that they want to tell, and. I will always try to make it bigger and, and uh, more authentic, but the story comes from them. Captain Phil got really sick, and he had a stroke, and, and he, he survived about nine days after that stroke, but he had final moments with his kids. He had, you know, it was these, these times that 
you're just not meant to see, like in real life. You just don't see him usually. And, and to give it to kind of, to lay it out there is Captain Phil, you know, most shows, there's a line, you know, you, you just don't, you don't follow certain things. For this show, it was one of those moments where, you know, the hospital, they shut down our guys. Like Todd Stanley was with them, he was filming, and, and the hospital shut him down. And one thing that, that it like gets me a little choked up just thinking about, but so what happened was Phil was out of it. He had just had a stroke. He was completely out of it. And, and there was a, a, an argument going on between our camera guy and, you know, and, and this, this nurse, who, this guy who was just very, very like, you know, jerky about it. Cause sometimes in Dutch, they don't like us being there. They're like Hollywood or, you know, hate you guys. So they, they were really mad that we were even in there. And Todd was trying to explain, you know, Todd's friends with Phil, you know, they were, they fr they're friends outside the show. Like they like each other. And he was like, you know, no, I'm here. Like the kids wanted him there, but they're like, he can't consent. Get out. They're always looking for an excuse to like shoot, shove you out the door. Phil came to a little bit and he, he kept going like this. And he was like moving his hand and they brought him a piece of paper and, and a pen. And, um, oh God, see, it's like, oh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a tough scene because it was one of those moments where it's like, again, that happened. He, he wrote down, must have an ending to my story. Like he wrote it. And it was like, it was squiggly, it was kind of messed up, but he wrote it and he just like went back to sleep. And it was like, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> like that, that, that was one of those moments that happened. Like that was, it, it was, it was from a movie. Like that's, but the guy, like he, he kind of knew, I think he, I think he kind of knew was happening, but he wrote that to like, cause Todd was always telling him, you gotta have a beginning, middle and end, man. You gotta give me the bites. You gotta, you gotta tell me what I need to know so that the, the audience can, can hear your story. These are, these are things that you almost, you couldn't script that. You couldn't, you know, it's just so real that it touches your heart a little bit. You want them to be doing what they're doing. That's it. Because it's a very documentary style. Like, that's what I love about it. It's documentary style. It's like, okay, like, we're watching these things happen as they happen, you know? Like, there's these events that, that go on are just like, some of them are epic and some of them are just lame, but then when you really look at it, they're like, wow, you know, that's a, that's a real moment. That's, that's a moment between two human beings that they caught and... Let's hear the story. How does that play out? You know, because we've all been through it. A lot of people can relate to some of the stuff they do. You know, these guys have these guys have money issues. They have family issues. They have, you know, some of them. A lot of them have legal issues because they're, you know, <laughs> they're they're some of them are rugged dudes. But there's there's a lot of things that you can relate to and you see in them when they're out there and and to see the humanity there. Like to when someone says they miss their kid or when they miss this, it's great. You know, great to see that.